Welcome to tonight's episode of Mission Inspiration. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to attend Sunday evening service, follow Jesus the Peaceful One, and save the world. Save the world. Save the world. Welcome to tonight's Lamoni Heartland Mission Center Sunday evening mission inspiration service. My name is Kevin Bruner from the Bloomington Congregation of the Community of Christ in Lamoni, Iowa. And I look forward to sharing with you tonight, along with all the others who will participate in this worship. And I want to express my appreciation to them for being a participant in this worship. All are welcome to worship God and to share in fellowship, to be yourself, to become who you are truly meant to be. Tonight, we focus on the theme, This is the Bread, which is based on the lectionary scripture from John chapter 6, verses 51 through 58. I'd like to share, a, as part of the opening, a story that came from the Daily Bread just a week ago, which seems very fitting to our theme tonight about This is the Bread. And it comes from the Daily Bread, last Sunday and was written by Karen Peter. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is Karen's story. Growing up, we ate sliced white sandwich bread bought from the grocery store. It made decent cinnamon toast in the morning and sandwiches for lunch boxes. It was not great but it was not horrible and we didn't give it much thought. But occasionally my mother would bake bread. She would set the large bowl of kneaded dough on top of the clothes dryer in the laundry room so the heat and humidity would help the yeast. As the bread baked, the mouth watering aroma would permeate the whole house. And if we were fortunate enough to be home, then the bread came, when the bread came out of the oven, she would just let us rub the butter wrapper over the tops of the loaves. Then she would take out the serrated knife and give each of us a thick slice of the freshly baked goodness. That bread, kneaded, baked, and sliced in my mother's kitchen, was nothing like the store-bought, everyday bread we usually ate. The bread my mother baked filled our senses and satisfied our appetites. It looked, smelled, and tasted glorious. For a busy working mother of three, it was a generous gift of time, energy, and love. I think about that bread when I hear Jesus speak of himself as the bread of life. Not the everyday bread that has little taste or texture, but bread born of effort, sacrifice, and love. Bread that has heft and weight in it, the bread we yearn for. Like the aroma of baking bread, Jesus fills our senses 
and captures our full attention as we seek to respond to this amazing, generous gift. As we discover ways to embody the message and ministry of Jesus in our communities, let us respond with our whole selves and may we live out the fragrant, satisfying, life-sustaining qualities of the Jesus we proclaim and follow, Jesus, the bread of life. I would like to personally thank Karen Peter for that story. And I'd also like to thank Richard Hawks for joining us this evening to share his testimony. And I'll share a little bit more about Richard later in the service. Thank you to all those who have participated both in sharing in the service and who'll be listening this evening. We hope that you are truly blessed by the spirit of the Lord. Welcome. We are so pleased to be able to share and worship with you this evening. For our kids in mission thought tonight, we have a testimony of a newly baptized member of our church. Alistair Courtney was baptized last Sunday in Little River near Leon. And he's going to share with us about his experience. Alistair? Hello, everyone. Hi. You want to tell everybody um, in your own words what you feel it means to be baptized? That I get to go to heaven. That you get to go to heaven. And when you're baptized, God says it washes away our sins and makes us new. So living your life from this point forward, what does that mean to you? What? Living your life now, after you've been baptized, what does that mean to you? Choices that, that you'll make. Um, that um, Choices that I'll make. To honor God. To honor God. Stop. To honor God. And to serve him. And to serve him. Mm -hmm. And how did you make the decision to be baptized? Because God tells us that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. And did you take some brief pre-baptismal classes? Yeah. And what did those say in those classes? And what did you learn from those classes? That. God wants us to be baptized and he loves us no matter what we do. Good. Can you tell us what the actual baptism felt like? What it was like when you went under the water? What did it feel like? Was the water cold? It was cold. The water was cold though. And refreshing. Yeah. So that's that's Alster's testimony. He, um, we had a good day at Little River. There's a lot of people that were there in attendance. Um, and it was, it was just an awesome experience for all of us, but especially for Alistair. Well, Alistair, we appreciate you sharing tonight. Thank you to you and your father for sharing about your baptism. We are so excited that you were baptized last Sunday, and we look forward to sharing with you in many different services in the future as well. So thank you very much for sharing your testimony tonight. Well, are you ready to sing some songs? Let's, uh, let's join in in singing from Community of Christ. Sing, Community of Christ sings number 96. And after we sing this song, Allison Martin will offer our welcoming prayer. Story, not a before. This is our. 
our story, this is our song, praising our Savior all the day long. This is our story, this is our song, praising our Savior all the day long. Past, present, future, joy, sorrow, hope, we write the story and life is its Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting us all get all be together in this way tonight. Open our hearts to your word and bless all of us with your spirit. In your son's most holy name, amen. Are we following Jesus the peaceful one? I invite you to reflect and share how you've been following Jesus the peaceful one. As Deb shares with us her story in her testimony in this peace moment. Deb? This is a quote I was taught. While it's our responsibility to not purposely offend one another, it's an even greater responsibility that we not let ourselves be offended. I've pondered these words of wisdom many times over the years, sometimes successfully following them, other times not so much. Growing up, our family was dirt poor. Nine of us lived in a drafty old two bedroom house in Missouri. Winters were particularly gruesome as wind blew through the cracks in the walls and the single pot belly stove attempted to keep up with the demanding cold. Christmas neared and our grandparents sent money to our mom to use as she saw fit for presents for us kids. All I asked for on my wish list was a 98 cent fountain pen. It was the going thing, everybody had one and I yearned for that little instrument. Mom assured us each night that while we slept that she was working on our presents, we were rather excited. When Christmas morning came, there were no stockings filled with goodies and very few packages under the tree. My oldest sister received a few gifts. The rest of us just had two to share between us. The gifts mom had worked so laboriously on were two very warm, cozy quilts for our beds. I was totally distraught. Couldn't they have used less than a dollar of the money spent on my sister's gifts or bought one less yard of fabric to purchase my pen? In the greater picture of life, this incident seems so silly. The quilts indeed were what we needed, not just not what this nine-year-old wanted. But I harbored the anger and sadness for close to 40 years. I wasn't upset with my sister, but felt totally unloved, unimportant, and rejected by my parents. While the pen incident isn't the only experience that fed those feelings, it seems it was a beginning since it remained extremely vivid as a memory. So what does this have to do with anything? Had I been old enough to heed the wisdom to not allow myself to be offended, perhaps the ensuing 40 years would have been a bit less painful. Since that lesson, while not always successful, attempting to avoid taking offense allows me to continue working for Jesus in sometimes very discouraging, heart-rending, and faith-testing circumstances. If we truly understand the depth and breadth of God's love for us, we can learn as a Christian community to not take offense to labor together in love, pray with unity of purpose, listen to understand one another heart, another's hearts and come together under God's divine grace to work together to heal the wounds in our communities, indeed the world. Let there be peace. Cindy and Max Pitt will lead us in some meditation and a prayer. Thing I had talked this over and I decided I would share some maybe uh, response or reflective thoughts 
as you meditate and Cindy will offer a prayer. At the end of Deb's statement there, I think it was, let there be peace. And, um, and my next thought was, and let it begin with me. Uh, I hope that we gathered here that that's Deb's personal story. That's not just a story that she read. And uh, that changes it for us. When Cindy and I read this over, it, it impacted us. So it's very personal. It's very honest. And out of that, she clearly understands the need for peace within. It takes courage to share um, that honestly and uh, specifically a life story piece into um, even in a room of those that you know well, let alone who might, uh, might be online who you may not know as well. So my takeaway is that just as Deb acknowledged, we need to feel understood to bring about that internal calm, uh, to be, feel loved and understood that it may not take 40 years. Our role in our families and especially in our church family is also to find the way to help people, our loved ones, if you will, and those unloved ones or to feel understood and loved. So there's that old line, I think it's a Covey um, habit, if you will, to seek first to understand, then to be understood. And all this takes time, whether it's love or hopefully ultimately peace, but building the trust and that uh, listening, uh, not just to words, but to feelings, to the point where I feel understood is um, one of those things that all of us need to keep working at, maybe even if it takes 40 years. Will you join with me in the peace prayer? Oh God, sometimes the simplest things in life cause the most distress. Feeling unloved, unheard, uncared for, lead us to dark places of self-doubt and fear. How every individual in your world needs to hear they are loved, that they count, that they are worthy. Give us the wisdom to not be offended, the strength to reach out to others with unconditional love and affirmation. Let us bring peace to the sphere of influence in the places we live and be vessels of your peace. Amen. Thank you, Max and Cindy. So I appreciate uh, Tracy Martin's willingness to share her testimony about a new ministry experience that we call Recreational Church at Bloomington. So I'm going to ask Tracy if you'd share with us. Yes. Good evening, everybody. I was sitting on my porch, but um, my neighbor decided to start bailing hay while I was out there. So I figured that might be kind of hard to hear me over. Um I've been attending Bloomington for about 12 years now, and I continually feel blessed to be part of such a loving and responsive congregation. In April, our congregation received an email from our pastoral team um, with a new ministry, um, ministry concept called Recreational Church. So this felt to me out of the blue, but I wasn't surprised because um, I consider Blooming to be, Bloomington to be pretty innovative when it comes to new ways to worship and trying to meet those needs and desires of everyone. Um, sometimes we'll have a Disney service or sometimes we'll have cowboy church out at our state park nearby. So I wasn't surprised that there was gonna be new awesome opportunity for us to worship together this summer. The intention was to create an intergenerational opportunity to recreate in ourselves a Christian life. Throughout this summer, every other Sunday evening, we've met for two hours. Several of us in the congregation have served on committees to plan three elements of each night. First off, there's an hour of activities. And whenever I first read that email, I think the word competitive was in there, which I love. I've always loved, I've got three kids who are 13, 15, and 17. And I've always loved that when our 
when our Lamoni ball teams win a game or win a tournament, our congregation claps. They appreciate that competition and know that it is a fun way to connect with other people. And so the desire was to have some competitive activities each evening that we met. Um, we had a kickball tournament. We've had a night of cards. Um, we've had yard games. We've had quite a variety of really fun activities. Our horseback riding and driving range night got canceled due to rain, unfortunately. So we got to be inside together playing cards. So that was really fun. Um, after an hour of activities, we gather together to eat a meal that is provided by a committee. And week after week, we have amazing homemade desserts and great food. So it's really fun to eat together and pray together and have that fellowship time. After our meal, um, we, are, we meet for a short high energy worship. And um, we've gotten to hear several testimonies and devotionals of some sort. Um, the idea, like I said, is for it to be kind of high energy, but it's um, really been a wonderful time to reconnect with each other. In a time when it's been easy for us to feel separated from each other, Bloomington has intentionally created opportunities for us to be together, share experiences and joys and concerns on those nights. We listen to each other, we eat together, we pray and sing. And I think I can speak for us all when I say that we definitely feel connected to one another. My favorite part is being outside in God's creation as evidenced by the fact that I tried to start off outside tonight. And I probably will, will go by after Chris makes his first swath in front of my house, <laughs> bailing hay. So, um, but I've loved being outside in God's creation um, with some amazing disciples that I've missed worshiping with on a regular basis. We have fun together and it's an opportunity for us to catch up and stay connected. Next Sunday is a Hawaiian night, actually. Um, Julie Rivera is going to teach the hula and we're going to have our third campfire. So I think we can all agree that um, campfires are an amazing way for the young and young at heart, all ages to feel energized and feel connected with the spirit. So we're looking forward to that third campfire. I would encourage us all to reach out to those with whom we feel disconnected at this point. We should recreate those friendships and continue to find ways to serve those around us. And again, I, I am eternally thankful and blessed every day that um, I get to be a part of the Bloomington congregation that puts such an emphasis on us being together and kind of overcoming the obstacles that this last year and a half has provided. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Appreciate your sharing your testimony. Our theme scripture tonight will be shared by Jeannie and Jim McKinney, and they will be sharing it and leading us through a scripture and also a meditation. Jim and Jeannie. From John 6, 51 through 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. In Jesus, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give his flesh to us to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I am them, just as the living Father sent me. And I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. 
This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever eats this bread will live forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As we prepare to listen to our guest minister's testimony of Jesus Christ, let's share together in Community of Christ Sings, number 148, As the Deer. We are so blessed to have Richard Hawks chair with us tonight. He is a retired president of 70 in the Community of Christ Church and currently resides in Michigan with his wife. Richard, we as a community of Christ welcome again you to our presence, and we look forward to what you have to share with us tonight, and we ask God's blessing upon what you share. Richard? There. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Good. It is a blessing uh, to be here tonight um, and to share with you. And I want to give thanks to God for this opportunity. Um, as all of us are, know that during the pandemic, Zoom is uh, a new vocabulary we have learned and used very well. And uh, one of the many advantages with, Zooms, with Zoom is that um, people can attend from anywhere. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm joined by uh, an older brother and his wife from Seattle and a nephew from Grand Rapids, Michigan area, uh, and many others. It's also good to see a lot of names uh, as I went through the introductions uh, of people here that uh, some I've known for a long time. Uh, Deb Crowley and I go back to when we were teenagers and Zions lead together in the Lansing district. So go back a few years. Also, it's good to hear what's happening at uh, the Bloomington congregation. Um, I remember attending Bloomington when I was a student at Graceland back in the late 60s. And also, I remember Bloomington is one of many congregations where we sent uh, student teams to bring ministry when I was campus minister at Graceland uh, back from 89 to 93 and have some heard some very good testimonies about Bloomington and uh, 
uh, how well they're doing. Just want to share a little bit about this is the bread or Jesus being the bread of, of life. <coughs> As my family knows me well, I love to eat. Um, and uh, though bread is a, a basic food, um, about five years ago, I was visiting with my brother and his family and my in-laws in Seattle, Washington. And my mother-in-law, where I was staying with my wife, always wants to have my favorite foods for breakfast. So she went out and found grapefruits and oranges and apples and bananas, and, um, and also some kind of bread with lots of nuts and seeds in it. So they were at Costco and saw this bread, and they thought they'd try it. And the first time I tasted it, it was at my mother-in-law's house, and it had the nuts and seeds, but the flavor of the bread was so incredible. I never tasted anything that good before. It's called Dave's Killer Bread, made at a bakery down in, in Oregon somewhere. And uh, after spending a week eating this bread, and I saved, the, there would be just one piece every day, saved it, took the rest of it home with me. Um, I went on their website and found out that they distribute all over the United States. The one place in Michigan where you could buy Dave's Killer Bread uh, and still is one of the few places is that Kroger grocery store. So that's, I go to Kroger every two or three weeks and make sure I got stocked up on Dave's killer bread. And I still eat it almost every day. So the idea of bread, uh, like the opening testimony we heard from Karen Peter, uh, bread is a basic food, but it is such a warm, um, delicious food for those of us who can uh, eat bread. Uh, some of us can't. And so bread of life is a very powerful theme uh, for me personally. Not long ago or several years ago at World Conference, a fellow was with me, my wife, and I had served at many World Conferences as part of the Presidents of 70. Um, and um, they're pretty, pretty much the same but at this conference, they decided to uh, do things differently and lift up the diversity in, in our culture. And uh, so they, when they served the, uh, the bread and they explained what they were gonna do, they had like four or five different kinds of bread type products. They had white bread, they had brown bread, um, they had uh, uh, rice cake um, and other kinds of bread to lift up the diversity uh, and, and a visual reminder of what the community of Christ uh, stood for and what it contained. Uh, even there at the World Conference, the diversity of colors and textures and flavors and shapes as well. And this bread um, was uh, such a powerful uh, visual reminder of what Jesus was about. And my wife was very touched by that. And, and also when they served the, the grape juice, they had uh, grape juice, they had water, and they had coconut milk as well to lift up the diversity that way. I'm going to, to recite a couple of familiar lines of scripture and you can say this along with me. Uh, I'm a little old fashioned with this scripture. I use the King James Version. It's the very beginning of the Lord's Prayer. And so let's say all this together until we get to the second or third line. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. What does Jesus mean to receive our daily bread? One commentary says that we're not taught to pray for many days, but for one day. God is therefore reminding us of our continual dependence on God. Nor are we taught to pray for luxuries, but for bread. In other words, necessities, food, shelter, clothing, and health. We also pray for bread for our souls, the grace to 
be reconciled to God and to persevere and to know God better. But mainly, we pray that we may be fed daily on faith in Jesus Christ, who is our true daily bread, and may be worthy partakers of the bread of blessing, which makes us one with God and one with us. The living bread is to be fed spiritually as well as physically. I'm not sure how many of you are here tonight uh, have uh, actually read or, or uh, received we see the daily bread. Um, I remember when the daily bread, when I was a child, we would get it once a month. It was a, a magazine. Uh, it had a month's worth of devotions on it. Now it's been a, a online for, for many years now. And um, if you don't receive it or haven't heard of the daily bread, you go to the World Church's website and enter daily bread in the search. You click on any entry that will have a, a daily bread there and they have a, a tag on there to subscribe to it. I would highly recommend that because um, though this is it's daily bread is a collection of testimonies of um, some articles about Jesus being our, our bread uh, in many ways, shapes and forms. And uh, everyone has a, a, like a, a picture that relates to a scripture and then uh, some writing. And the welcome uh, tonight was, um, was one of those daily bread entries from the 8th of August. And so that's an idea of, of what you can receive uh, for free every day. During the pandemic, I think this daily bread um, and as well as other forms of daily bread has become very, very important. Some of us, have been virtually shut in, um, had to maintain social distancing. Some have gone through quarantining uh, for safety reasons. Um, but when things shut down, uh, it was uh, a big shock for all of us. Not for a hundred years, we had this kind of uh, societal shutdown or impact because of a pandemic. It's important that when we think of this bread that Jesus represents, is that we especially think of it as not only the daily bread that we need for ourselves, but also the daily bread we need to share with others. God's love and caring. This is our witness to share what God has blessed us with. And by the same token, to accept that bread given by others as well. Sometimes sharing our daily bread happens in ways that are unexpected and we're not fully aware of. At a church family camp several years ago, I was asked to, I'm always working with young people, it seems like. At this one particular family camp, I was asked to, um, help the primary class out, the primary teacher. And uh, she had maybe eight or 10 kids um, and to be there uh, as a supportive uh, adult. And, um, uh, and these kids were excited about everything. Uh, I was just amazed at how excited they were. This was at a campgrounds uh, in the mountains, a beautiful setting. Um, it was just an amazing place uh, to be. Um, and it seemed that every break that these kids have, uh, as well as other kids from the classes, uh, as most campgrounds, they had swings. They would always head towards the swings. And they would, and since I was hanging out with them and available, they wanted me to push them on the swings. When they found out that I could push them so high that the chains would go slack, then I became very popular at that family camp with those kids. As I was pushing them on the swings, one of the little girls from the class, about nine or 10 years old, I noticed that she always wanted to make sure I pushed her and that when she wasn't on the swing, she was standing right next to me, almost like my shadow during the, the free times we were on the playground. And I didn't pay much attention to it. My, I've been always taught to, you know, someone uh, wants you to stand with them or sit with them, uh, that's what you do. 
And so she was always beside me with the other kids. Uh, one afternoon, we even took a, a little short hike up into the mountains and uh, had all these adventures together. So we went through the family camp and it ended on Saturday. The next day, Sunday, I happened to be preaching in a congregation that was in that, that district at that time, that area. And it was a pretty good service. Uh, there was a good spirit there and so forth. And right after the service ended, uh, as is customary, those of us on the rostrum would um, walk back to the back of the church to be greeted by the people in the congregation. And as we were walking back towards the back of the church, it was a small, fairly small church, I could hear the phone ringing, because uh, they had a landline phone, in the pastor's study. And uh, as we got to the back, someone answered the phone, and they said the call was from me. And I thought, this is interesting. How did somebody know where I was uh, that Sunday morning and uh, that the service would be over at that time? So I excused myself and went into the pastor's study and talked on the phone. And when I picked it up, there was a lady on the phone who I could tell was um, emotionally overwhelmed. She was, she was in tears. And she asked, is this Richard Hawks? And I said, yes, and I had no idea. What, um, what, was gonna, what she was gonna say. And she said, I am Kathy's mother. Kathy was the little girl I was sharing about at the, the, in my primary class at the family camp. And she said, I just want to share something with you. Um, she said, our, our daughter uh, was in some serious problems, uh, having serious problems before the family camp. We were considering uh, putting her in a, a residential facility uh, for treatment because of her behavior. Uh, she would talk back. She was trying to run away from home a couple of times. And they were just at their wit's end what to do with their little girl. Then they decided last minute to send her to the family camp with a relative. Uh, Kathy promised that she would behave well, and she did. But she said when she came home the night before, it was almost like she was a different person. She said for the first time in, in quite a while, uh, Kathy um, did not talk back. Uh, she was nice to her parents, her siblings. Uh, she uh, uh, didn't express any desire to, to run away uh, or say anything uh, really negative. Um, and she, it was like her whole personality had changed. And her mother tried to find out, well, what, what happened uh, at this uh, family camp or reunion? And Kathy kept talking about how excited she was in her primary class and about her teacher and all the things they did. And then she kept bringing up my name, that I would take them places, that I would push them on the swings and hang out with them. Um, and for some reason, uh, that had such an impact on Kathy that I had no idea what was going on in her life, that she was a troubled child um, and, and barely was allowed to come to the family camp. And my testimony is that when, when God uses us or places us in situations um, where we can either impact or be impacted by, by other people, uh, that truly is the bread of life that Jesus is talking about. That truly is our daily bread. It's not something that we just consume spiritually just for ourselves. It is something that, that equips us to be uh, Jesus' hands and feet in other situations. And in this case, uh, in a situation um, that we may not even be aware of where somebody is deeply affected by, by our presence. Uh, Kathy's mother shared some more and uh, she was just very grateful that I was at that family camp and that I was her daughter's, one of her daughter's uh, teachers. And uh, that whatever I did that had such a profound effect on their, their little girl. That was 
both kind of scary to know the impact that, that I had on somebody else, but also a testimony of the strength of God's love and caring, how it can impact even a life of someone uh, this young. So that was uh, uh, something that I learned that has shaped my ministry uh, as a 70 in the church uh, to always be open to uh, people uh, sharing um, and, and also to listen to people, uh, listen to what God is saying to them, um, either as a, a blessing, as a, as a need, but that our daily bread is how our souls are being enriched and fed and connect with other souls in ways that God um, uses us to be there, uh, to be blessed or to be a blessing for, for other people. I believe that uh, as the closing hymn we'll sing in a few minutes says that we are truly companions on the journey, breaking bread and sharing life. Also as part of that song, that we're no longer strangers, no longer strangers in God's house, that we are fed and we are nourished by the strength of those who care, by the strength of those who care. So my prayer is that all of us will seek every day to, uh, to have that daily bread be a part of our lives, that every day that we will see ourselves as uh, God's presence in the lives of other people, and also to listen and connect that presence in other people's lives in their situation. So give us our daily bread is not for us to just keep that daily bread, but also to share that freely uh, with others as God has shared with us. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. We appreciate your testimony tonight in taking time and being with us. And, and we're very thankful, too, that uh, your family and others were able to join us. So thank you very much for your testimony tonight. As our service nears an end tonight, uh, we would seek God's blessing for the week ahead and for our lives. And so as evangelist Gwen Simpson offers a prayer of blessing, may we listen and hear what God speaks to our heart today. I'm not getting it. Thank you, Kevin. Would you bow with me as we offer a collective prayer now? Eternal Lord, we are reminded that in all circumstances of our life, that you are our provider. You nourish and feed our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. Your love is woven throughout our lives in countless ways. We acknowledge that we are blessed beyond our imaginings. And yet we admit that we are hesitant at times as we face the world and our future. We are touched by the uncertainty and the anxiety that permeates our world. Yet we come this evening with a deep longing to break away from those hesitancies, a longing to be open and receptive to your call to us as individuals and as a church body. We long to unlock the doors to our hearts and throw them wide to receive to clear away the cobwebs of our mind that seem to bind us. In spite of our hesitancies and uncertainties, we yearn for a closer, deeper relationship with you. We desire to be more courageous, even as Jesus role modeled so often in his life among us. We want to welcome new understandings and new feelings and new relationships and new opportunities that you present to us daily. This then is our prayer this evening, Lord, that our eyes may be open to where you are truly work in us, in our neighbors, 
and in the strangers we meet, both far and near. Unstop our ears so that we may hear your words in the depth of our being, in the hearts of our neighbors, and in the sounds and the voices of the world. May we see what needs to be seen and hear what needs to be heard, no matter how challenging that may be for us. Grant us the courage to raise the questions which need to be raised and the faith and courage to risk laying ourselves open to new thoughts and clear visions in spite of how uncomfortable that will make us. Give us the courage to question the status quo, the strength to wrestle with the challenges that face us as a people and as a world, relying always, Lord, on your guidance and the Spirit's presence. Strengthen us now to take our place in the midst of your ongoing creating, sustaining, and redeeming work in the world. To the invitation you offer us this evening, to follow where you may lead us, to risk and stretch as never before, may we answer yes. In the spirit of Jesus Christ, we pray and ask for this blessing. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you very much. Gwen, we appreciate your prayer. Please join in singing. We are companions on the journey. Hymn number 552 in Community of Christ Sings. Probably a slight technical difficulty there, Glenn. Yeah, we lost the internet connection from the uh, slideshow. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, Not a problem. I think that tune is sort of singing through our minds now, and we are truly thankful that we've been able to break bread together and are sharing life together. So we, we appreciate that. Appreciate all the participants in the worship service tonight. And as I share ascending forth, I hope that this scripture will, will call us to truly be able to trust in God's promise and believe that the bread that we broke tonight was that of Christ. As Christ's body, lovingly and patiently bear 
the weight of criticism from those who hesitate to respond to the divine vision of human worth and equality in Christ. The burden and blessing is yours for divine purposes. And always remember, the way of suffering love that leads to the cross also leads to resurrection and everlasting life in Christ's eternal community of oneness and peace. Trust in this promise. Thank you all for sharing with us in worship tonight. We invite you to share in fellowship with each other and hope to see you again next week. And now here, I'm gonna turn this back to Glenn Johnson, our Mission Center President, who will direct us in sharing in the lobby. Glenn? Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Beautiful job presiding this evening as always and a beautiful service. Thanks to everyone from Bloomington Congregation for your participation. Uh, just a testimony filled service. And of course, a special thanks to uh, Rich Hawks, uh, Rich and I go back a long way to when he was serving in Southern California in the early 1980s, and I guess maybe late 70s there as well. And boy, it's just uh, wonderful to, to hear your testimony tonight, Rich. Uh, I particularly enjoyed hearing you share about how the symbolism of the bread at World Conference meant so much uh, to you and Othella uh, in expressing the diversity of all who participate in the life of Christ, and also that wonderful testimony about um, being in, in that family camp experience and being able just to be the hands and feet of Jesus unknowingly by your ministry of presence, uh, something that we're all gifted with, just being present with others. So what a rich testimony, uh, and I'm not surprised, but I'm very grateful uh, for your sharing this evening. So thank you. Um, so let's uh, open it up for, for everybody to participate. I'm doing this from my iPhone, so I can only see four of you at a time. So, so let's just, don't be afraid. Just unmute yourself and, and, and share. Uh, I'll start with some good news. We had, uh, th this seems to be the season of baptisms in Lamoni Heartland Mission Center. So last week, we just heard about the beautiful baptism service at the Little River uh, and uh, today there were two baptisms at Northwest Congregation, one in the church sanctuary in the baptismal font, uh, and then later in the afternoon at uh, the Raccoon River, uh, another one of the rivers in Iowa that's capable of sustaining a baptism. Uh, and then next Wednesday in Lamoni, uh, seven o'clock, hope everybody shows up at the pool, there's going to be another baptism uh, so just just wonderful good news all around to, to see people responding uh, and and able to uh, to to express their faith in God and, and their commitment to Jesus Christ in, in the waters of baptism. And of course, you know, just like we would if we were at the water side right now, we'd say, and if there are others who would like to step forward, you are called upon to do so. So extend that invitation to your friends, your family, as always, to joining the waters of baptism and become a part of community of Christ. Uh, so that's my good news. I preempted a few people who probably were going to share the same thing. And you can share your perspective on that, by the way, because I didn't go into it much detail. So please um, feel free to share some good news. And, and then we'll get to prayer concerns as well, of course. The service Wednesday night for the back. It's in Lamoni. It's eight o'clock at the oh, pool. Eight o'clock. Thank you for that clarification. I, I, I would have showed up an hour early, which is probably just fine. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm curious, and I know Jan DeBarth is one, but I wonder if there are how many of the people out there have baked bread and smelled that aroma coming through the house. Mm -hmm. Marie, yep, 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 wasn't that, yep, okay, thank you. That picture you saw tonight, Kevin, believe it or not, I baked that loaf of bread. <laughs> very good, very good. That That's a hidden talent you haven't shared with us yet, Glenn. No, I'll have to get working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, I have to the... say, it was good to hear from my brother tonight. This is Harvey out in Seattle. Well, thank you for being with us, Harvey, and and it's only five o'clock here. Oh, yeah. You guys are doing great there. The sun is still shining. 
<laughs> yeah, it's just setting here. You, you can probably see a little sliver of sunlight behind me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, well, thanks, you, thanks for being with us and sharing with Rich. Glenn, this is Steve Smith in Lamoni. And I just wanted to share a piece of good news. Liberty Hall has received uh, two grants, one from the Iowa Historical Society and the second one from Decatur <laughs> County to renovate and develop Spurrier Schoolhouse, a one-room schoolhouse uh, on our site. And uh, so we're going to be doing that. It's a year-long project. But as a part of that, if there's anybody listening who has information about the Spurrier Schoolhouse or whose family attended or anything like that, or they taught there or anything they know about the Spurrier or Black Schoolhouse or other school run one room country schools in the area, I would love to hear from them. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, maybe we should get everyone a challenge to, to go through the old online newspapers that are available now and see what they can find. <laughs> yeah. How many of those one-room schoolhouses were there in Decatur County back in the day? Do you have any idea, Steve? There were quite a few. Uh, yeah. Dave, Dave DeBarth was telling me that each township had its own schoolhouse and they had a guideline to build a school so that no child had to walk more than two miles to school. Um, so number of townships had more than one school, including the township where he grew up. Um, so uh, there were there are apparently quite a lot. So at least 20 or so probably across the county. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And so this was known as Spurrier or Black School. So what will be involved in the restoration project? What kind of work will you actually be doing? Well, this summer and fall, we'll be working on the exterior repairs that are needed and uh, scraping and painting, repainting, and then also on the interior repairs, repainting that's needed there. Um, and then also beginning this fall, recruiting new docents for the site and training them and, and involving them in researching, teaching methods from about 1900 one room schools. Uh, and then over the winter recruiting schools, school districts to have them bring uh, field trips to Liberty Hall and Spurrier School in the spring. And then having our docents ready to, show, to uh, lead those field trips for the schools. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. And I'm sure everyone knows that they can also make a contribution as an individual to uh, the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation and earmark that for Liberty Hall if they uh, would like to do that as well to help support all we of us. We appreciate projects. that. We have to raise about $1,700 at Liberty Hall itself as matching funds to qualify for the grant. So Perfect. we would appreciate any, any, everybody's help on that. Mm -hmm. the, the challenge is therefore issued right now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Who, other, who else has good news to share this evening? I just want to share, I noticed Dale and Linda Robinson are here tonight. Dale was my roommate at Graceland. Uh, we had a lot of uh, quote unquote adventures together, didn't we, Dale? <laughs> Oh boy, I, I, I'd love to hear about that, especially in light of our last couple of weeks in Lamoni. <laughs> and this is before Linda's time, so she, she's probably still explaining to her what went on, so. <laughs> That's great. I, I did hear about that connection earlier this week. Uh, Dee Jones couldn't be here uh, tonight, I don't think, Rich, but... Uh, she was disappointed. She's she's traveling, I believe, still. Hey, uh, they're, they're on, Glenn. They, they're, oh, they're, they're on. The car. Oh. They're watching, yep. Oh, they're, they're watching we're, we're, the sitting in the, we're sitting in the car. We're in a little town, Hardin, Montana. We had a hard time finding a place to find internet. It's the middle of nowhere between Billings and Sheridan. But we finally found a spot. You're on Hi, your Rich. way back home. <laughs> yeah, we're on our way back home. Hi, Rich from D and Terry.
great. Uh, who else would like to share what's been going on? Well, Mel and I went to the baptism this afternoon, sort of. We went to the wrong boat landing. Oh, and no. so we were about 10 minutes late. And by the time we got there, it was all over. Oh. <laughs> the baptism and confirmation. But we were able to stay and visit a little while. The kids were having a great time uh, because the water was very shallow. I guess they had to really, um, it was only maybe maybe a foot, not even a foot deep. <laughs> so they had to work to uh, get Dan dunked. But it was beautiful weather and a beautiful time. Um, we, had, we had a lot of, of the Dofler family came for the both services today. And one of the little guys in the family, Tyson is his name. I don't know. He, maybe he's about 11, if anybody knows them. He did a phenomenal benediction at church. Just, it wasn't read. It was from his heart. And I thought, well, there's our little next preacher. <laughs> he's, he's got the spirit. So it was, it was really awesome. A great service. Yeah, I, I mentioned that also, Deb, in the sharing in our HEB small group today, how, how he just shared from the heart. And at a couple of po points in the middle of his prayer, he really had to stop because he was thinking about what he really wanted to say to, his, to God and, and thankfulness for his cousin's baptism that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just wonderful. Then he just yeah. wrapped it all up by saying, <laughs> and the people said, amen. <laughs> it was wonderful. So just for a point of clarification, so... Um, who was baptized this afternoon? Deb? Dan and uh, Andrew Dofler. Okay, Dorfler. so both of them, yeah. Of them so, so Tyson uh, Tyson will be in the sixth grade, so he'll start sixth grade okay. in the fall. Phenomenal and, young man. Yes, <laughs> and I wanted to let Steve and Joni know that uh, they can sign me up for a field trip in the spring for Liberty Hall. <laughs> didn't get a chance to do that last year because of COVID, but hopefully in the spring we'll be able to, to do that. And I'm glad to see Christian in the back of that van. As I miss seeing him around town. <laughs> I'd also just like to say thanks to Rich again. It's, it's so nice. Um, this has been a Michigan connection weekend for us. Uh, because, well, we see Rich tonight, but yesterday we were able to see Mariah and uh, Tristan Hewitt. And Tristan is from Upper Michigan, the West Branch area, where we have a congregation. His mom and dad came down for uh, kind of a little reception for Mariah, Mann, and Tristan Hewitt, now, now Hewitt, got to see their babies. And so a lot of connecting with Michigan folk that I really appreciated <laughs> was fun. I want to thank everyone for the beautiful service this evening and everyone that participated in it. I, I remember Rich Hawks when he was at Graceland and over the years. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you to Richard. When he was campus minister, he took two of my children and another young lady to Michigan to a youth camp. And occasionally we get together and talk about that. Yeah, it was a great experience for those three young people. Thank you, Marie, for sharing that. So are there any uh, prayer requests that anyone would like to share uh, with us before we uh, depart this evening? Yes, Glenn. This is uh, Jim McKinney in Lamoni, and uh, I wanna lift up my wife, Jeannie who's struggling with fibromyalgia right now and uh, really put on a brave face as she helped read the scripture. Uh, she's uh, getting ready for a trip to Texas to help her sister who fell and uh, broke a 
broke her spine and is having a tough time. So both of them, for sure. And I'd like to also uphold my daughter-in-law, Sue, in New Jersey, who tested positive for COVID and is uh, feeling all the flu-like symptoms and feels like bricks on her chest. And we uh, pray for her well-being. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll add uh, all three of them to the prayer list. Any others that would uh, like to request prayer? This is Mel Crowley. And Debbie and I administered to Norma uh, a couple of nights ago. She's from uh, Lamoni area, and uh, she has a broken leg and will have surgery tomorrow to repair that and then uh, be here, I guess, for a while with her, her son. That's Trish, Mel. There's two different oh, that was Trish. to Norma, who is from the Moni area, and then Trish, who is from uh, Missouri, but her son, the Chrishells are here. So both of them can use prayer. I'd like to add Stu Silver. Uh, he's had uh, some cardiac irregularities and they can't cardiovert him until September. September 10th because there's no anesthesiologist around to, to assist. Mm -hmm. So, um, and he's also had flu on top. He's of that. had flu on top of that, and he hasn't been feeling well. So, uh, we hope that he stabilizes on medication. Uh, but uh, he's had his struggles <clears throat> and may need to be cardioverted on September 10th. Then, Jim thank you. Is there anyone else? Is there someone who'd like to offer a prayer uh, before we close? Um, I'd like to add one more to Betty Fox lost her daughter to COVID about two weeks ago, a week ago, three weeks ago, three weeks ago. And so, you know, she's had to isolate uh, on top of losing a daughter to that disease. And so adding her to the list. Thank you. and I can offer a word of prayer. Thank you, Kevin. God, we pause to you, giving you thanks for our ability to worship together across the country. But we also pause for a moment of seeking you and your direction, your healing spirit, to be with those who need your presence in their life at this time. Uh, we're mindful of Jeannie and her sister, and also the daughter-in-law that's uh, ill with COVID, we, we pray for them, Lord, that you give them the strength, uh, give them some healing power and my presence to be with them, that they may all be wise and that those who would surround them may care for them and help them with, regain their strength. We're mindful of those good people that Deb and Mel have administered to. Uh, we know that as you continue to bless their lives, you will seek to care for them and bring a spiritual blessing to them. And we, Lord, we uphold them again to you. You'd be with them and bless their lives and keep them in your care. We're also mindful of Stu Silver and, and the struggle that he's having with his heart and, and the physical illness that he carries at this point. Uh, we uphold him as well, Lord, that you would bless him, that you would care for him and, and be with his family, be with his spouse, that they may have your support and blessings to bring him to full strength again. Lord, we're thankful for the presence of your love and for all that you do. We're mindful of those who have lost loved ones recently. Uh, we're, we're mindful of Betty Fox and the loss of her daughter. We're mindful of all those, Lord, who have lost people, lost friends and family to COVID. 
and we pray a sustaining prayer for them. And we pray that you would bless us with wisdom as we continue to move forward, that we may have your spiritual presence to be with us in all that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And the, thank you all again for joining us tonight. We hope that you have a blessed week. A reminder to our pastors and CFOs, we do have a meeting tomorrow night. Um, and uh, there will be additional uh, email regarding that, but it was in our link uh, uh, this for this service as well. So uh, look for your email tomorrow with the specific details tomorrow night at 7. Thank you. And good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.